publicly, trying to draw various funny animal frames over and over again. We are working on, an, on a custom Rivals of Aether project for the Steam Workshop. Hit that button, and that window isn't even open again. I've been tampering with this darn tablet for about 10 minutes, and it still doesn't seem to be working for me. But we should be back in the saddle and ready to draw once more. Welcome. So, what we're focusing on now is trying to determine our character personality through the expression of the animations themselves. This is a discussion that I had on stream last night, where probably the single most important and interesting part of character design in fighting games is that specific to fighting games, you need to know everything about them through their fighting style. James, very glad to see you. Welcome back. I'm gonna be having a lot of fun tonight. So what you're focusing on here is trying to get animation frames or stills or cells. For the most part, we're looking at keyframes, which will be determining our characterization of Xander the Salamander, or whatever project you end up going with. We're still debating the possibility of if we do a human character or if we do a lizard of sorts. So we're going to look for keyframes here. And we might have certain tropes or other references we might draw from. But we have a variety of different poses that we'll be looking at, at here. The good thing to start with, that is the most characterization you have with someone, will be for their idle animation. Why do you keep defaulting back to gray? One of these days I'll get used to this software. What do you use, James, by the way? I'm using CSP just because it's what most of my friends have recommended to me. And we are ready to rock. So let's see if we can look at, did we have it from last week? Hmm, maybe I didn't save it, hold on. Let me move that off this screen for a little bit. I swear I saved that reference here somewhere. Ah, looks like I didn't. Well then, Lizard Xander in the first sketch is dead, so I'll mostly have to reference myself. Use the sketchbook for most of your drawing. Hmm. Noted. I'm still trying to find myself a convincing reason to stick with digital arts. I used to do a lot of sketching on paper in high school and in my earlier years of, years of college. I had great interest as a cartoonist previously, but I've definitely fallen out of it in the past few years. So this will be an excellent refresher for us to get refamiliarized with it. Set that default color to black since that's what we'll, what we'll be using for the most part. Actually, while we're sketching, why not just a little bit of a somewhat contrasting blue against the background? get ourselves our layer here. Hmm, I think that's a bit dark. We might want to go for a little bit lighter. All right, so an idle stance on some characters is going to be very expressive. It's where you mostly determine if a character is high energy or low energy. Blaze Warrior, welcome. Glad to see you here. We are going to be discussing animation for our Rivals of Aether project. The idle stance is determining mostly if your character is high energy or low energy. For the most part, you'll see a lot of characters generally relaxed, but everyone knows the characters that you find in certain games, such as Fox McCloud in Smash Brothers or Rashid in Street Fighter V, who will spend a lot of their an idle animation just dancing around. Usually that's for the more evasive or speedy characters, whereas a lot of heavy characters might have an imposing stance with widely splayed shoulders. 
For a Xander character, it might be something a little lazy or laid back. Since this is for a more of an aloof scientist character. Ah, Kayla, welcome. Glad to see you as well. So, we're going to try to be mostly light and rough on these sketches. You know what? Just to make it a bit more fitting, why not use a pencil? Isn't that cute? So, get our little bean shape to start with. Have a couple of little ridges, sort of signifying where the eyes are supposed to be. Ah, it's doing that thing again. This is the issue I was struggling with for about 30 minutes before the stream last time. You, I press the tablet pen down, and even though I start moving it, it doesn't do anything until after I've moved it a certain distance. I wonder what's causing that. Is that a snapping feature? Maybe it's part of the stabilization. Well, I'll be learning this over time, and so will all of us. So we'll want to have mostly standing up straight, so drawing a bit of a skeleton here. Might be legs oriented opposite each other. Sort of a wider stance on the legs. Now, for a bit of the sort of smug aura, we might end up going with, as we were showing on last stream, either hands in the pockets or on the hips. Roughly drawing a skeleton for our figure here. And go ahead and draw a rough little lab coat, starting there and ending here. Get the outer part of it. For however little familiar I am with art. Ah, that does kind of look horrible, doesn't it? Should we go back to a pen instead of a pencil? That might be a bit better for us. Let's go ahead and stick with a pen from here on out. Have a rough... Oh, that's going to make this horrible. Look at that. Start drawing a circle and we always get that little straight smudge at the beginning of it. What if that's a adjust by speed? Is that part of it? Huh. We'll figure that one out. Question. Does a ring appear if you hold down the pen on one spot? So far, no. That's me holding it right there. And it doesn't seem to be doing it. I can wiggle it around a little bit and it'll start drawing out a line. Forgot how I solved it last time. Hmm. What do you mess with over here? Might warrant a restart, or at least plugging the start thing out and back in. Nope. We'll just have to deal with it until you have a solution for us. Go ahead and get a... Wow, that is going to make this horrible. Start with getting a rough shape. It's going to make it very hard to draw any sort of cur curve. I had a similar issues caused by Wishes ish Windows Ink, but that doesn't seem to be what's ca causing your issue. Hmm. Just by speed, that wasn't it. Ah, it still applies even without any stabilization. I thought it was a stabiliza stabilization effect. Hmm. Bring that back up to compensate for my shaky hands. I suppose we shouldn't dwell on it too long. Can't really do too quick of strokes here with it, can we? J 
just to get a slightly better perspective, we're going to be using Rano for a lot of our references, given that he is, as a tree frog, probably the closest thing to the image we'll be trying to replicate. So he will prove as a very useful reference for us. Scale that down, roughly equivalent to what we're doing here. Roughly on the right size. Ah, too much. Color margin, turn that down. Oh, that's still going. I guess we don't really need to worry about the outlines too much, do we? No, let's get another one. I wonder if that one will be any better. CSP is very bizarre about how it handles transparent PNGs. That one's not, not going to be any better now, is it? We'll leave it. So, see if we can kind of replicate that shape. It's mostly... That's weird. Oh, that's the eraser, of course. So it's mostly sort of a... No. Okay, I see. I still had it set to the transparent divide, transparent color there. Mostly a elongated shape. I was giving it a lot more of a rounded top to the skull, but it seems for the most part we can keep it flat near the top, and then we mostly focus on the eye ridges for what we'll be doing with the eye expression. And we might even try doing glasses on top of that. deal with that obnoxious little start to the lines there, we might as well do that for what should be the forehead. Oh, the rough equivalent to it. Set on a couple of little arches here. Blaze Warrior, my friend is creating a video game with all the characters from different franchises. Naruto, Hunter and Hunter, Final Fantasy, Blaze Blue, and Guilty Gear. Interesting, is he doing that on an existing engine, like Mugen or something else, or is it a uh, full-blown project in an entire game development suite? That's actually where I got some of my initial interest in this. I was trying to do a lot of Smash Brothers modding about 10 years ago, and there were plenty of custom character versions that we'd have. It was mostly modding Brawl. That was the first Smash Brothers that was incredibly moddable. Might as well draw while talking. And so there were a lot of characters that would have model swaps or vertex edits, or in the case of some of the earlier, lesser ones, a texture swap which mostly tried to look th make them look towards the character they're supposed to be representing. Da da da, get that. Get that lab coat started. And so we'd mostly be trying to bring in a lot of characters from our favorite franchises. And I remember at the end of a lot of our uh, days that we'd play, I'd go ahead and ask around to anyone who'd attend. It was at a gamer, pro uh, a gamer club at school, interestingly enough. Merge with layer below. There we go. Y'all watch me slowly learn what I'm trying to do with this over time. Da da da, silly little lab coat there. And an understanding of anatomy will definitely come later. Work on those shoulders. So I wonder if we're going for a hands-in-the-pocket sort of thing, which definitely has a more sneaky vibe to it. There's quite a few characters such as Yamazaki from King of Fighters. He does keep one of his arms in the pocket the entire time. The implication is that the ar that's the arm that he's better with, and so he's holding himself back by using his less capable arm and keeping that in his pocket. He'll bring it out for when he's doing some of his bigger attacks. 
Hands in the pockets might be an interesting idea. Storm the Jolty Boy. Hey, Xander. Just saying hi. You can't stay at the moment, but you wanted to drop by and show your support. Well, thank you very much, Storm. If you have a chance to swing by later, you're welcome to join. There's also always VODs saved up on my YouTube channel, in case you ever want to come back and watch. Warms my heart to see you stopping by, though. Go ahead and work on a little shirt collar there. Since I don't have the greatest knowledge of anatomy, that's mostly why you see me drawing a skeleton for my character first. That's how I'm mostly trying to get some start on understanding bodily proportions, and we'll still be mi mixing that up over time, but this is a learning process for all of us. Full-blown project. It definitely sounds ambitious, Blaze Warrior, but usually projects like that need to have some sort of a foundation or a direction to make sure that they succeed. Certainly sounds great to be speculating these ideas, but I would love to hear more about it in the future. When we were doing our Smash modding, we had a lot of crossover characters from our favorite series that most of them didn't come with their own movesets, but we'd try to bring them together, and while they'd still have the same moveset as the character that they were modeled over, for example, I know we have a couple of Halo fans on this channel, and myself being one of them. Someone, interestingly enough, made a Master Chief model for Snake, which is definitely where it would be most befitting. And so, you'd have Master Chief running around, and even though he'd be using Snake's explosives and all of his other tech, that's the closest thing we had to a military character to use there. Go ahead and just doodle something of a belt buckle there in the middle. I think keeping the legs spread might be a better idea than keeping them facing in the same direction. If he's going to be standing up, for the most part, we we'll want to keep him generally sort of tall and slightly imposing as for a stance. Sort of a smug he-he-he, I'm planning exactly what I'm going to be doing so I can be a step ahead of you the entire time. Never played Halo. Well, Blaze Warrior, I'll let you know that in the future, as we draw closer to Halo Infinite's release date in the winter, that's going to be something I'm going to focus on a lot on this channel. The first big thing I was trying to prep for was the release of Guilty Gear Strive. And although there hasn't been much success in that regard, that's still the most popular thing on my channel. The next big thing I was gearing up for was Psychonauts 2, but as it is with most single-player games, that storm's kind of blown over already so quickly at this point. Next big thing I'm trying to prepare for is the release of Halo Infinite. Go ahead and draw the bottom of those pants. And for the next few months, months up until the release, I'm going to be trying to run through the Halo campaigns on this stream. I might even start with the first one next week. Let's see. Looking at our dates, the most important next thing to be showing up is the release of Melty Blood on the 30th. Oh, won't be blowing over for a while, you promise that. All right. I'm glad to know. Apparently, uh, people are still out there for Psychonauts, so... Let me know. We might go ahead and try to have a cleanup stream for Psychonauts, too. Maybe go around and see what other little collectibles or dialogue we missed. I haven't even played it since our last stream. There's a couple more things I wanted to uproot, but I've been trying to focus extra time on our streams here. There we go. This is going to be a very talkative stream for Xander. You know what? I might even try to skip out on the Guilty Gear next Friday. I might try to do Halo. Drunk Halo might be on the might be on the schedule. Because I'll definitely need to be drunk if I want to get better good enough to be able to last through it. I'm planning on doing C E Legendary first. You know what? I'm playing it up a little bit, so 
Might as well make it a thing. Either... Nah, let's say, let, let's do it. Let's do it for next next weekend. Possibly Friday, and possibly for a Saturday stream, depending on how the scheduling goes. Once Melty Blood comes out, I want to try to ride the FGC train a little bit again. Because of that, I'll be probably doing a lot of Melty Blood and a lot of Guilty Gear to go alongside it. <laughs> and then I know even just later that week, the new Nicktoon Smash game comes out. Don't push yourself too hard, just try the best that I can. If I'm going to be completely honest with myself, if I wanted to grow this channel, I'd focus mostly on less streaming and trying to work on some video editing in the meantime. But I've had... Oh, that toe looks ugly. I've had the absolute most fun these past couple of weeks with the streaming. I've gotten quite a few new people to show up, and... You know, it's the most fun I've had in a long time. So I admit I've kind of wanted to just sit back and do the streaming thing. It's the part I enjoy the most, but I did make a promise to myself that this weekend I'd go ahead and try to round up a few clips for a compilation. Guess we shouldn't focus too hard on getting the feet looking right. They're gonna be they're gonna be silly, they're gonna be oversized and ugly for now, but we're going to want to try to replicate the even though this is an amphibious tree frog, he's going to have roughly similar feet. After all, I think that's what salamander what salamanders look like. I'll try to edit together a couple of the favorite clips I've had. I've already had a few recommendations from my friends. Might drop a small compilation soon. And the videos separately, which I might just throw onto social medias here and there. Twitter, Reddit, and the like. Look at all these precious lizard boys. We'll use a different picture this time as our reference for how salamanders are supposed to look. Scale this little bad boy down. Make him properly sized to fit with the rest of the nonsense we're doing here. And while we're at it, flip him horizontal so he's facing the same way as the rest of the boys we're drawing with. Yep, mostly seems to be the same. Although, interestingly enough, he has four toes instead of three that we see on Reno. But given the similarly, similarity to a lot of other cartooning tropes that we see, it looks like Rano only has three digits over here as well. You know, that's an interesting question to answer. Poison tree frog. Oh! Well, that is an incredibly important distinction for us to make then. We'll definitely need to incorporate that into the design. If you look, you see four toes on our little salamander boy here. Whereas Reno here has three. But if you look at a picture of a poison dart frog, do you look at that? Does he have four toes? It's hard to see on this picture. They might be sp spread out a lot more. Ah, it looks like they have three very long digits, and then a very small one after that. Ah, oh, right, they both have four. That would, be, that would have been a very interesting thing to learn. Similarly to how a lot of American cartoons will reduce a five-handed finger to four, looks like they've reduced a four-fingered... Did I say a five-handed finger? A five-fingered hand down to four. We might be reducing a four-fingered digit, or four-fingered hand, down to three here. It's four toes on the back feet and four toes on the front feet. Noted. If he's going to be standing flat to the ground, he might want to represent that a bit better. 
So instead of having those splayed down, down to the ground, we might try to replicate what we're doing with Reno here. Go ahead and we see how that first toe is portrayed, where the edge of it here comes out further than the ankle. So we might go ahead and dip this down a little bit and then do the same for the next two toes. We'll figure out exactly what we're going to sprite, if it's going to be three toes or four toes when we're getting down to the actual sprite stuff. He has, not PS4. <laughs> That's the issue with text-to-speech, Kayla. It's another reason why I'm still not too keen on doing text-to-speech recognition. It's a little flawed. It's so hard to draw with that. Look at that. That little linear notch at the beginning. So obnoxious. We'll figure out that setting. I might just need to reinstall the drivers or something. This would be an excellent excuse for me to get more familiar with the software out otherwise. Now, the reason why I haven't paid too much attention to the face is this is where we have an opportunity for a very interesting start to our characterization. Now we could have gone with the eyes that we were drawing previously. Go ahead and shorten the si size of those lines. Most important thing to remember is that we did go for a surime eye design where they have a pinch more towards the top here at the back. That is generally used for more sly or fierce characters. So that's one potential eye we could be doing. Wow, it's not even going to let me draw short lines like that. Hmm. Hold on. I might have to look this one up real quick. CSP. Pen. Oh, what is it? I don't even know how to describe this issue. Starts drawing straight lines? Without lines at the side. Okay, this sounds like the exact issue we're looking at. This post was deleted by the person who originally made it. Okay, here we go. We have another issue on the forums here. In the environment setting, Tablet to use, tablet service to use, one tablet, one tablet, switch configuration. Tried turning off Windows Ink and, okay. What the heck is Windows Ink? I've never heard of that. Maybe this is what's been messing with me in the background so far. Anyway, I can turn this entire thing off. Nothing. 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 I suppose that's a start. Windows setting to device and then pen and Windows ink. Ah, seems we'll be running around back in circles again. Ah, uh, we'll go with that for now. We'll definitely have to do some research, on research onto this. It's horrible. It's not even going to let me draw the little lines I'm wanting. Maybe if I do the short strokes like that. We'll have to deal with it for now. How does Rano draw his eyes? 
mostly horizontal little almonds, and he has the little highlight in the middle. Compared to our gecko boy, salamander, gecko, we're mostly just going for something lizard-like. That's mostly a black pupil. We can go ahead and... I guess... Why don't we try doing the same thing here? Draw a little highlight in there. You know, that's honestly super cute. But that's one idea. The other idea, and I did try to sketch it a little bit otherwise, if we want to really, really play up the smug nerd bit, we can just go ahead and give him giant circles for eyes. Doing the exact whole super expressive glasses thing again. Go ahead and draw that there. Draw that there. And you'll have to get it very, very delicate to put it in the right spot. And then go ahead and set our back color to the background here. Fill that in. And would you look at that? We have giant nerd glasses. We might need to reorient how the nose is shaped around this. Let's go ahead and edit that a little bit. I think if we focus on keeping the face flatter and then the eyes just sort of in the background, we definitely leave more room open for the glasses to be showing themselves here. Give him a little smirk. No, I said smirk. There we go. It's a start. We have the separator here of the back of his eyes, and then he sort of has the darker people in the middle, so... We might try to replicate that a little bit here. Give him a more horizontal pupil orientation. And then erase just a little bit out of it. That's a start. So we either pick that or I drew the smirk on this one. Funny enough, if you have the glasses, you'll have to be more expressive with the other parts of the face, given that you won't be able to see the eyes. So that's the first of our ideas that we can work with. So we'll have either a full hands on hips or maybe in the pockets. That would be an interesting way to make it a bit more sneaky. One of the things we'll have to settle on is if we're fixating on a flashy or a sneaky characterization. We can definitely do both. But whichever one we weigh more heavily on will determine what we're doing for the animations afterwards. Set ourselves back to black. Walking animation is something that we probably can't handle too well with keyframes. So a lot of our motion stuff, we might not be focusing on. What we'll mostly be focusing on for this stream is attacking animations and the keyframes that we find in those. Take another drink. Walking is going to be, in most cases, a very fluid animation, and we cannot express that with a few slow stills, given that it took us 30 minutes just to get through that first one. So what we'll be focusing on now is mostly attack animations. Starting with the jab, which is what we'll be seeing a lot, given how very important they are in Rivals of Aether. Go back to our layer one, we will name that as our sketch layer. So I know exactly which one I have to click on every single time. Getting back up here. So, we have a science guy with an ambiguous set of scientifically related powers. We have the option to choose between potentially using gadgets for some of his attacks, or leave that for the heavier attacks. He might be doing some sort of fancy science bits where he's 
flicking little electric or atomic sparks at you. I've brainstormed a little bit about this in the off time between the streams, and the idea I've come up with. While we're starting with the, we'll just make this a little loose. Very loose, we'll have to make it loose. Getting our rough lab coat frame. Get that down, it dips over to the other side. So leaning into the attack is something we'll want to do for a start. So for that, we might twist his other leg to be facing a little bit more forward. His right leg, the one that he has furthest from his opponent. Lab coat ends there, so this should be roughly around where the waist that we're looking for. Get that. He'll start facing forward a little bit. And we'll maybe have this leg set to be facing directly towards the camera to, re to signify a slight rotation. But not a complete one. Draw his little toes here. Connect those. Go ahead and draw the line for the pants. That is roughly the center of the body there. Front leg might be bending forward just a little bit more. Go ahead and draw that. And then his feet are going to be mostly facing the same direction as they were before. That's not the foot that he'd be rotating. Oh, goodness, this is horrible. All right, I'll have to bust that ghost once we're done with the stream here. We don't have to just draw in tiny little lines from here on out. Seems like it lets me do that somewhat. If you release that pin quickly enough. He's mostly rotating the back foot here, so I'll have that facing forward. Give him a little uh, autosave. Wow, that is really going to make it difficult to draw. I have that sketched in the background. Da da da, neck. Just draw that for the shirt. Usually, with fighting game characters, when you have them face... Ah, oh, I forget. What's the name of it? That's what it's called. Open Stance. So, Open Stance is what you see on 99% of fighting game characters, where they are facing towards the camera, even though realistically in a fight they'd probably be facing more towards their opponent. We'll define that here. Front facing towards towards camera. And what you'll notice about a lot of fighting game character animations is that while they're in open stance, they will attack with whatever side of them is facing towards their opponent for their lightest attacks. The front arm is the closest one to your opponent, and is the one that you will be able to reach with a decent distance first. So, our first jab here, the first in our three hit jab sequence, since I don't think we're doing anything else yet, we'll definitely be doing two, but we'll have to figure out on if we're doing a multi hit attack or a third jab finisher later, maybe letting you do two jabs and route to a tilt instead. Go ahead and draw that, that shoulder. Let's see. Go ahead and reference that. Maybe that should be a little further out here. Extend that a little bit more. Uh, sleep can probably go out farther, but we're mostly looking for a shape, not necessarily the distance. Get that lab coat. Start that. shoulder here. Now, one of the things we have to think about is if he's going to start out with... Da, 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 da. We'll go ahead and just doodle in a little eyeball there for now. Now what we need to figure out is if he's 
being more relaxed and he's going to keep his arm in his pocket for this for the beginning animation of this attack so that's one way we interpret this this is definitely for the more smug sneaky interpretation of xander where you'll see he'll still have that other hand in his pocket when he's doing his first attack and here's what i've been le leading up towards little little thumb up there extend that little finger out there give him the little knobs towards the end of it actually i think that's more specifically a frog thing look at our little picture of frogs again frogs actually have the sort of bald tips, the rounded tips to their fingers. You'll see that a lot on Rano here, but our salamander reference looks like they're mostly just rounded tips and they don't sort of ball out to the end. So you might adjust that accordingly. No bulky fingers here then. So here's the idea I came up with. Give him a little uh, finger poke going out there. Sort of a little finger gun for that first jab. Have the third finger bowed up there. And then maybe have a little electrical spark hitting at the end over here. Just as a rough sketch. So that's the idea I had in hand. What we can definitely play around with is if he's being completely laid back, keeping his right hand over here in his pocket, or if he's preparing for his next attack, and he could be drawing that out and have some room for expression over on the other arm here. He could be getting that out and ready, and he'll have hide that pocket Have that out there, and he'll have a little hand showing up. Get the little fingers curled, because that's how they would have been in the pocket, and he is starting to draw them out. And then thumb would be on the inside, so we wouldn't see it from this end. We'd mostly just see those two fingers there. So, either keep the hand in the pocket for the sneaky bits, or pull it out as he's more invested towards the actual fight here. Very quick jab, go ahead and just poke him a little bit with the little finger guns there. Jab two. The second part of our ever so important jab sequence. I said make it black. Now, this is the part where we get a lot more expressive with how we're handling this. A lot of one-two jabs you'll see in Smash characters if you study them, say with Fox McCloud or Mario, and it even applies to a lot of other fighting games that have multiple punch buttons that link into each other. You rarely see someone attack with their same with their same hand twice in a combo. We'll go ahead and draw, make another layer for animation lines. We'll go ahead and use these as a representation of how we're drawing motion here. So if we're wanting to sell the motion of the attack itself, you'll notice that characters are usually attacking with alternating limbs. This first one goes up here for an attack, but when he does a second one, we're going to bring the motion of the whole body twisting around, sort of in this direction. We'll do that for the other leg coming forward, and this leg is going to twist in this direction. And to show the largest amount of expressive motion that we can, we're going to need to attack with his right arm, the one in the back next. So this one, to correspond with the rest of the body twisting, is going to come up to the front, and he's going to attack with that one instead. You'll see just about every character's one-two jab will start with 
their front facing arm first and then this and then even though that's not a universal trope that they start with the front facing arm the actual universal trope is alternating whichever hands you're attacking with and the only exception for that would be say very asymmetrical characters such as nightmare from soul caliber he has one very large arm and one very small one, and although I don't think he has very many punching attacks, you'll see some characters with a very big amount of asymmetry to their design. If they have a very large weaponized right arm or left arm, they might go ahead and attack with the same limb twice, but if they're symmetrical, they'll always be alternating limbs, not alternating strikes. So, I'm going to need maybe a bit more of a skeletal look here. You know, now that I'm visualizing it in my head, it might be an unfortunate JoJo reference. We'll try to make it not quite so much JoJo reference, but we're wanting to do roughly the same thing here. Give the little finger guns a go, but we're going to do it with the other arm. So, go ahead and... Start with the head, which is going to be facing directly forward. Go ahead with that little eye bulge, and then we'll draw the little eye right there. And then... Oh, that's still in the animation lines layer. That's going to be the most important part of drawing, is making sure you're on the right layers every single time. Give them a little eye ridge. We'll just take that line and incorporate that into the eyeball itself. Now what we'll focus on with the skeleton here is getting that spine to sort of stretch as he twists. And it's going to curve down here. Then from there, let's see, what would it be about the right spine length? I think right there sounds about right. We'll have his feet firmly planted in place, but he's going to twist the rest of his body so that front leg, the right leg, is going to bend a lot more and still going to be facing the feet roughly towards the camera. So draw in those little toesies there. Get the rest of the pant leg in. Do that over there, sketch this. Have this come up here. Anchoring his entire body in this direction. Then we'll have lab coats, which we'll actually finally get to draw differently, from a different angle this time. Go ahead and do that. We'll see a lot of the back going on here with the way that the spine is curving. Lab coat comes down to about here or so. We can go ahead and do it with the spine since we have a bit more of a reference here. I've unten unintentionally made a JoJo pose here in retrospect, but we might have a few different ways we can focus this one. Say, a full body twist to where he might be facing away from the camera for this attack. This arm is going to come out here, straight, into the lab coat, draw that, and he's going to do the same thing with the other hand. But, since it's facing the other direction, we'll be drawing the back of the hand here. And outward stretched finger. And since we're drawing the back of the hand, we're just doing the little knob there. Give him another little spark. Let's rotate that 45 degrees now, shall we? Maybe give him a little twinkle sound effect as he does it. I uh, gotta really sell that sparkle. So that happens in that direction. Go ahead and draw the rough shape of the lab coat, which is not going to be his entire body. That's actually going to bend down here. Now what we need to decide is, given that he's front facing for this entire animation, how much we'll actually be able to see of the rest of his body. 
other leg is probably going to be extended out just a little bit farther here. That's going to remain firmly planted on the same part of the ground. And go ahead and draw the same little toe here. And keep the rest of these extended out here. If anyone has any ideas to contribute, I actually I would actually very much love to hear them. And go ahead and do that bit of a shirt collar. Body's going to extend around that way, and we might. Hmm. Oh, what is that JoJo pose? Uh, what, what is it called? Zawarda. Um, I'm going to have to look for that one. It's the one that Axel does for his time stop as well. I'm not trying to do the exact same thing here. I think the important part of that pose is that the back arm actually is bent back here for that one. And correct me if I'm wrong, if there's any JoJo fans in the comments to allow me to recognize that a bit better. So instead for this one, we might go ahead and give him a little flourish with his other arm. Have that come here. Mako, welcome! We are working on our animations here. So glad to see you. Go ahead and bring that arm up, and it's going to be mostly in the same pose. Since we're not since we're explicitly trying to avoid making it deliberately a JoJo reference, we'll leave that finger up there, and it's going to be doing the same thing. Definitely highlight the other arm. So the important thing to notice here is from our first jab animation, just to give Mako a bit of history on what we've been doing, to Prince Floyd was hype. That's actually something I'm not familiar with. Catch me up on that. Da da da. So our first jab there, we're doing the finger gun with the left hand. And since we're not trying to do the Jojo pose, we'll go ahead and bring this one up here. And then you'll see the rest of the body pretty much twists forward and around like this. Then, of course, you know the second arm comes up here for that attack. It was a Rivals Direct today. I'm not yet a big part of the Rivals community, so I'm... I might have to look at that. Unofficial workshop direct. I'll definite. Hold on. Let me write that one down. You know what? We'll save this one. It's going to be right there in the schedule folder. And da, 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 da. we'll just throw that in there. And we'll just throw that around for the animation references. Void today, sky tomorrow. All right, I'll definitely be there for the second one. A little late, boss, but you're here now. Overslept, start all the way over. Well, since we have both Mako and Broham showing up here, we have a bit more to talk about. Catching ourselves up, we are currently focusing on what we're doing for the animation direction for our Xander character. Here we have the idle stance, which is mostly the same as what we sketched out yesterday. One thing we're debating is if we're going with the regular eyes here, or if, we, or if we want to go ahead and go for the full nerd glasses, but that might detract a little bit from how we can render the expressions. Also, it's difficult to get glasses on a creature with such wide-set eyes as that. That is an issue we'll have to tackle with when it comes to the spreading part of it itself. As well, earlier I was mentioning, mentioning the notice with the fact that Rano here has three toes and three fingers on both of his arms. Even though actual tree fogs have four fingers and toes, that might be a consequence that we'll have to deal with, given that Rivals of Aether tends to deal with very, very small resolution sprites. So because of that, we might have to reduce what should be a four-toed salamander down to three toes for our animation. But we'll mostly be able to handle our animation because of that easily enough. 
Our idol stance that we're focusing on is going to be somewhat laid back, sneaky, a little smug, like myself. So we're either going with hands on hips or hands in the pockets, and then just generally a relaxed open stance facing somewhat towards his opponent, but also mostly towards the camera. We're talking a lot about open stance here, which is how a lot of fighting game characters are animated and expressed. In just about every 2D fighting game, you don't have characters facing directly towards their opponent. They'll be facing slightly towards, or even mostly towards, the camera themselves, and they'll leave one part of their body facing towards the enemy. Wow, Xander's doing a lot of talking. Take a big drink there. So, one of the fundamental things you'll notice about animation on fighting game characters Given that 90% of them are in open stance, their fastest, fastest attack is going to attack with whatever arm is closest to their opponent. So, in this case, the left arm here. That is something that you'll see on just about every one that you study. Fastest, fastest attack is whatever attack has to travel the least amount of distance. And given the fundamentals of fighting to go along with that, we'll alternate arms. So... We've only gotten through the jab animation that we've been talking about so far. And that's going to be cute little finger guns that we have here. The obvious part of how we're going to draw this out is the fingers that are doing the animation themselves. But what we have a lot of freedom with is the characterization that we do with the arms that are not attacking. The second one, I really like the idea here, giving him a little finger gun pew pew thing there. But the right arm in the first animation here is definitely something we're running into focus on. Catching up, we first discussed that that could stay in the pocket as sort of a laid-back, disinterested way to express his animations. Or he could start bringing it out and getting it ready for the second attack. If we wanted to, we could even draw him doing little finger gun, finger gun here, getting that stuff ready as well. So, we have a very obvious and easy characterization with our first two jabs. What we want to think about is if we're doing a third one, or if we're doing a multi-hit attack, or just generally what we do with the third jab after that. We might have one of those characters. Mako, remind me, is it a user universal mechanic where anyone can cancel into their tilts out of their jab, or is it... I swear I've seen that on a few characters. I don't know if that's a universal mechanic or only uh, applicable to a few specific characters. If we can never come up with a third jab, that might be what we go for. What we're mo mostly focusing on today is whatever... Universal mechanic! Alright, that's interesting. We might only have to go with two jabs here. Maybe not necessarily needing a third one. Anyone have a suggestion for a potential third jab animation we could throw in here? Maybe both. Maybe give him a little finger gun with both. We'll go ahead and sketch that, just to get a little bit of an idea out there. And it's defaulting to blue again. Make that black. I love that font. A few workshop characters have it intentionally disabled for some moves, but very universal. And that's definitely one reason I am so interested in Rivals of Aether. Because we have so much freedom with how we're doing character move sets, and that they've up uh, upgraded a lot of the mechanics that were existing there. One of the things that I'm definitely needing to familiarize myself more uh, with more is the fact that you can wave dash a lot easier with just a side input and pressing dodge and jump simultaneously. So for third jab, he'll be slightly facing more towards the camera. Go ahead and, as we do with every single time, just draw a little oval for the face. This one, you'll see he's mostly facing straight forward. 
with the face there. This one, you can still see a bit of the back eyes, so he's facing a little bit more towards the camera. If you ever feel useless, just think about how Orkane Jab 3 exists. I didn't even know Orkane had a second one. I've seen Orkane the least out of the characters, and played him very, very little, so I don't even know the entirety of his moveset either. This one, you'll see he's mostly facing very frontwards, and this one he's facing very towards the camera, so we can mix them both together here. We'll have a bit more of a curved spine going on here. Get a little bit of a lab coat started. Collar, th collar there. Go ahead and curve this along with the rest of the form. Same thing over here, get that collar started. Get this roughly dipping down here. Orcane Jab 3 is so useless because of D-tilt, up-tilt, and F-tilt. All very good moves to be using instead. Because of that, we'll definitely have to make a third jab a lot more useful. You know what, in retrospect, if we're going for three consecutive finger guns, might as well implement that for the old arm as well. Go back and draw that out. So he's already brought out his finger and he's getting ready to do his little finger guns with it. He's getting ready. He's a very, very eager professor. And he wants to show you, show you his adorable magic scientific finger guns. But yeah, some characters have only one jab part, like Shovel Knight, some two. It's some three or four. I definitely remember Aeliana only having one jab, since she's mostly the character that I... Oh, and Clarion, both of them. Both of them basically being the only two characters I ever actually played with. So those are the ones I'm most familiar with. I'll have to play with those a lot more. Hmm. I don't know if I want to throw out some friendlies tonight. Schedule might be a little tight, so I think I'm going to go ahead and focus mostly on the animation part. Now, if we're going to be doing... Uh, collar goes there. Shoulder probably starts about there. And then we can have this going roughly here. Across the chest. Coming up out here, get that down there, other shoulder starts. Make that a little bit more rounded. Give him little sleeves. Maybe gear jab three towards being a strong finisher. Well, if he's bringing out both finger guns, it's definitely going to have a bigger spark. So we might have to draw a different little animation for that. Go ahead and get that there. Get his little bent finger. We're going to be a bit more loose on the sketches, probably here on out. We're mostly concerned with trying to get a direction, because especially... Given that, we'll have to draw keyframes and in-betweens and get it down to sprite level. We're mostly concerned with sketching out ideas rather than making it look good. So long as we can get the idea, I think we'll be fine. Double finger guns come out. Lab coat. Belt should be about right there. That is a very helpful part of the character design. You can draw... The belt signifying where the legs and chest separate. Legs and torso. Go ahead, draw the shoulders there. Shirt comes there. Collar goes around back. Eyes will show up. Both of them, since he's not facing directly forward. And just to get things going there. Get a little bit of a darkened pupil. Side this up. Hmm. 
Hold on, that's an idea. I think first we'll try to get the feet sketched down here correctly. Now here is the important key part of the animation. What we're focusing on is seeing how we can be expressive with the other parts of the body afterwards. So we have the option of, you see him leaning a little bit into this attack. Go ahead and sketch, uh, erase that part of the skeleton out from there. What we can do now is we can either have him really bow his legs and spread them out, sort of like that as a bit more of a gimmicky, loud, super expressive, open way to animate him. Or we can keep his feet planted firmly in place for that. If we are going with the much more expressive one, we'll definitely have to bend his spine further. He'll probably have to bend a lot further back, so he might have to sketch something new for that. We'll sketch two different ones and see which one we like more. We might even use both of them as keyframes for our animation here. Go ahead and draw that pant out like that. Just roughly. Pants there. Other pant there. Probably give him slight recoil on the feet in black, back since Big Blast, especially for doing a finisher. You've got some, some, some suggestions, but more of a visual explainer, not so much a verbal one. So what are your thoughts on an oversized coat that hides your arms and only show when attacking like Ram? An interesting idea, we might be able to implement that sort of for a... If we're going specifically for a character mostly derived from Xander himself, we're going to be definitely keeping a lab coat. In that case, we wouldn't necessarily have an oversized coat, and I'm trying to visualize that. One possible way to interpretate and the interpret that is with a coat cape. You'll see it on a lot of characters. I don't immediately know any examples off the top of my head. Let me know if you can think of one. But there are some characters. In fact, I think one of my friends getting into VTubing is doing the same thing. They'll have whatever coat they're wearing, but they don't have their arms in the sleeves. Instead, they'll have them tucked inside, like this. And then the sleeves themselves will just be left to flow freely. That would be a very interesting interpretation, having a lab coat like that. Cloth physics can definitely work if you keyframe them, definitely. A lot of Street Fighter V's animations fall short because, well, they use physics for a lot of things that should be keyframed. I like the oversized coat idea because that does give sort of an menacing, sneaky, I'm hiding a secret weapon vibe. I think... I think our best way to interpret that would be just keeping his hands in his pockets most of the time. Cloth hiding limbs is really an issue if it's a physics engine that obscures it. Like Street Fighter V. Exactly. <laughs> I know uh, Nekali's animations are an absolute disaster because his hair flows everywhere with physics where it could have been much better on some of it being keyframed. You can keyframe the animations and then use the physics for the in-betweens, I guess. Feet goes there. Go ahead and extend that out. Get the other toe. Get that toe. And for this foot, we might have that rotate a little bit further forward for the last one. Draw the toe there. Draw a middle toe there. Except V Trigger, except for V Trigger Nikali, they animate so well. Absolutely. So that's roughly an idea of what we're doing here. Hmm. Wonder what sort of little what effect we could do there. You got little twinkles. Maybe go ahead and have this be. Roughly the same shape. Go ahead and draw ourselves a cross in the center to build off. 
give ourselves a fancy little asymptotic graph. Curve those stars there. Much bigger spark for this one. And just to make it a little bit fancier, go ahead and draw ourselves a couple little circular rings around it. So to get a little crescent coming off, even though that looks mostly like a banana, so I'm just going to draw single lines instead. And try desperately not to draw a little banana instead. There we go. If you get the tips just right, it's going to look less banana-esque. There will be plenty of room for bananas later, trust me. If you think the bananas are unimportant now, that is some very ominous foreshadowing for you. Roughly do that for maybe an explosion on the third one. Have a couple of little crescents coming off of it. Now, another way we can anim animate this is making him lean back a lot more. Let's go ahead. Since we want our third jab to actually be a very important attack, go ahead and draw another potential animation for it. Or mostly a keyframe. The biggest thing we're concerned with is getting the attack frames where the actual hitboxes are out. Draw another little... Another little face. Go ahead and get those eyeballs in there. Draw a little circle. And for this one, we can really, really exaggerate the spine. Make him really lean into it. Uh, let's not go the full scoliosis route. Maybe have him start back leaning furthermore. There, that's a good example. And then, go ahead with the arms, since we know those are going to be locked in place. And I'll have to draw the rest of the animation around it. That's one. That's roughly the other. Go ahead and give him his little finger guns. Very sharp, very rough, and very edgy. Mostly because I'm having issues with my drawing tablet right now. For Mako and Broham, you'll see if I try to draw, say, a little spiral. It's not showing up too well here. But you'll notice this is me pressing down my tablet, pressing down my pen on my tablet. I'm going to start moving it, and there. See how it only started once it drew a weird line? Like, if I keep drawing spirals, you see they start with a straight line there, because for some reason, my software is not being very agreeable with me. Broham, have you seen this before? feel like you might have an idea. But that's currently making it hell on earth to try to draw this nonsense. So, we have the arms there, which are the important part of it. And we'll just, you know, draw a big circles since we already have an idea of what our effect should somewhat look like. Ooh, wait. While we're doing two different ideas, how about this? Give ourselves a sort of... That is definitely not centered, but we could try to do a little atomic explosion effect there instead. So you see Xander definitely needs to work on his hand-eye coordination. 
That's one idea. Yes, you used to have this problem. We had to, had a way to fix this. I have to go back in the messages, but you were having to remember. All right. That'll definitely make things a lot easier from here on out. Especially because perfectionist Xander is very concerned with drawing out something roughly perfect to start with. Go ahead and get that part for the collar started. It's going to bend very, very far back. Shoulder comes up to about right there, shoulder goes there, and here is where we have some fun. Go ahead and get the idea of where the legs are supposed to start, because we're going to do something different with the lab coat here. Instead, we're going to have it blow back a lot, which I think, hold on, let me try to visualize that. You know, the bottom part of it is going to wrap around like this. And it's going to come up and curve. And there. If we're going to have it blow out like that. Then go ahead with the legs. And this, this since we're doing a much more expressive an exaggerated animation here. That legs should start right about there. We're going to have the legs really bend. Get that one in that direction. And this one bending very, very far out here. We might even have them squat more. Hold on. We want him to stand roughly at the same height, but if we're doing a large finisher, let's go ahead and make him crouch even further. I'll draw this one out here. Draw this one out going in this direction. Get the legs really bowing together. Bring this bad boy over here. And we will once again return to having the back foot facing outward instead. So draw his little toesies going this way. Since he's mostly doing a big lean back into the attack. Not necessarily from the recoil itself, but as a way to make it a lot more expressive. Draw a little toe there. I could be drawing this a lot better if I wasn't having that issue. I think it's Windows Ink that's giving that to us. Who knows? Go ahead and draw the little toe there. Make that a bit more rounded. And it's still not letting me make my precise little tweaks to express this better. Mm. How painful. So, Mako, tell me. Anything particular stand out for you in that Rivals Direct? Workshop Direct? Anything catch your eye? And then for this one, we'll do something a little different in the fact that you can actually see the inside of a shirt on this animation. Likewise, the other part of the lab coat here. Come down here. And have that start rotating along with the rest of it. and start erasing our little lines in between. Get rid of the spine. Hopefully he doesn't crumple without anything to stand his weight on. Get our shirt collar started. 
And just because this is one of our important animations, why not draw that little tie in there? Hmm. That one's going to remain mostly obscured. We could potentially have the tie just bend up like this. Hmm. Not that. It's still not going to let me draw any of the smaller lines here. What a disaster. So have that little tie maybe come up there? Oh, I like that. Actually, I think that's a very cute and clever idea. There we go, a much more dramatic and expressive way to be doing that third jab. Go ahead back to our animation lines layer and mess with our colors a little bit. Your favorites so far are Ken, Dingo Dial, Chukya, and Pitts Link. Super hyped for, but they release tomorrow. Oh, that's some wonderful news. So on our animation here, we're seeing a lot more blowback and sort of a leaning back from the attack there. This leg moves in this direction. This one mostly remains anchored in the same spot, but you'll see it definitely pinches a lot more. Same with both legs. He'll be squatting down a lot more from the attack. The lab coats, I'll draw those lines along the coat itself. Those flare out, given that there's sort of an implied recoil going generally in this direction. As well, Ty also flips upward, and you'll see that the spine is mostly just him doing a lot more leaning back here. You know, I very much like that one more in comparison. A lot more expressive, a lot more wild. I think we'll stick with it. We'll definitely have more difficult drawing that spread out, but it'll pay off. Dinoc and Big Band are pretty cool too, though Dinoc isn't part of Two Prints, just released today anyways. There, someone's doing a port of Big Band from Skullgirls, or is it just a similar name? I'd very much love to see Big Band. Another drink. You know what, actually, let's go ahead and call that a little bit of a pause for a moment. I have to go get another drink real quick. Here, have a little poorly drawn heart. We'll be right back. Until I get a sort of intermission card. <laughs> I'll leave you with that for a little bit.
the prodigal son returned. Oh, whoops. Move. Keep that there. Move my face. There we go. Back once again on the stream. Delete that layer. All right, so we've expressed a lot through our jabs here. This is generally a very, very good foundation on how we'll be trying to express our character accordingly. Sort of gimmicky, a little silly, kind of sneaky, kind of smug. Overall, a slightly confident and roughly humorous character. From here on out, we have a lot more flexibility on which sort of attacks we're wanting to run through. I don't have too many ideas for the tilts or aerials or smash attacks, so if anyone has any specific ideas, let me know. We can start doing very different animations from here. We don't have to go walking through any sort of list. We'll do whatever works most accurately for our characterization from here on out. Big Ben himself is out. The big man. Good old Q, but actually a functional character this time. I'm very excited to see him show up. So, we have a variety of other attacks we have to deal with. First, the autosave getting in our way. Go ahead and get the darker text. Come on, type for me. There we go. So we can go ahead and start listing other things here, maybe up tilt. And we'll get a whole array out here. Up tilt. And a D tilt. Now, another thing is that you have noticed, and Mako has definitely noticed this, a lot of Rivals OCs have references to other franchises and their attack animations. Some of them will have the same attacks as other Street Fighter characters, like what I mentioned with Olympia, I think. She literally has just Makoto's, one of Makoto's specials, as her side special. If there are very befitting attacks we can pull from other franchises, we might go ahead and try to throw those in here. Uh, let's go for a little bit of consistency. Let's call them strong attacks in this case. Issue was all tablet side, stuff you probably don't want to deal with on stream, so ultimately nothing for, nothing for now. Well, that'll just be something to experiment with later. After all, I do plan on using this tablet more. I bought it, at this point, a year and a half ago, and have maybe only used it five times since then. When the whole words I shouldn't say on stream thing started happening, you all know what I'm talking about, starting a year and a half ago. I thought I'd spend a lot more time home and being, and I'd have more time to do this, but my work schedule for the last year and a half hasn't really changed at all. Nair, bear, bear. If Hungry Box was in the middle of a forest and he had to fight a bear, whose bear would win? Classic. Uh, oh wait. There, I think that's all the directions we're concerned about. Capitalization consistency, nonwithstanding. And hell, we don't even have to stick to this format that we have started here. We can go ahead and move these around and even focus on some of the special animations as well. You know what? Actually, while we're on the subject, if anyone else has ideas for specific strong or tilt animations, go ahead and give me some ideas, and I'll try to draw what comes to your mind, but otherwise, we might go ahead and focus on specifically the ideas that we already have in mind. You know what, let's go ahead and move up tilt out of here. 
Since right now we can definitely focus on something different. Go ahead and move you as well over here. Actually, you know what? We don't really need much of a Gekko reference now. We just mostly have to draw off of what we already recognize. So, the most important part of characterization, at least in a platform fighter, is done through their special attacks. Given that everyone has to have four of them, you have to pick very, very four, very important four different attacks for them to be doing. We already have a very clear idea on what we're, be, what we're doing for a side special. Which we're going to be calling, are you ready for this? Hold on. Hang on it for a little bit. Broham, you're going to hate this. Ah? Uh, ah? Uh? So, obviously a reference to our beloved boy Slayer's most important special. I'm going to go ahead and go to the Dust Loop wiki so we can get a couple of animation references there. Now, functionally, it's going to be a bit different. It's not necessarily going to be a backstep, what I'm thinking about, especially given that Rivals of Aether is a game with a lot more freedom of movement. We'll want to be doing something a little bit different for the actual dodge part of it. Uh, that's not a really good animation reference. Why don't we look at Exard? See what stuff we can pull from there. Allegedly, he might be one of the DLC characters coming soon, which I'd very much love to see. The party starter. Copy that. That's going to show up with a black background here. Wonder if I could just go ahead and erase that. There! And all of that will remain visible regardless. So there's that. And then um, we'll focus later. All you know is that there will be a laser involved somewhere. Definitely! I don't know where that's going, though. I don't know if that's just going to be a smash attack or something different for us to do. You know, I never noticed that part of the animation. They just kept his hair up there. So for those of you less familiar with Guilty Gear... This is the character I play in Accent Core, and one of the characters we're taking a lot of inspirations from. Go ahead and leave you right here. This is Slayer. He is a vampire character, and in terms of archetype, he is what we call a boxer. He doesn't have any projectiles, and his entire game plan is trying to get close to you and punish you throughout the game. You'll see Broham currently in the YouTube comments over there. Right here, this little, this little guy. Oh, wait, gotta have a pen. You'll see right here in the chat over here, a very, very upset Broham who has been pile bunkered time and time again. So he is very, very familiar with what we're doing here. And he is not excited for what we're about to be animating. So the idea for Dandy Step, for those of you less familiar with Guilty Gear, it's a very common bro boxer trope, say other examples being Dudley and Balrog. Uh, Balrog doesn't have a dot. Or um, Street Fighter Boxer doesn't have a dodge attack, does he? He does have some projectile invul invulnerable attacks on startup. Another example would be Makoto, so we'll go with Makoto and Makoto from Blaze Blue and Dudley from Street Fighter. A common thing for boxer characters is to have an attack which starts with a dodge here. And that is supposed to be used after they've baited you into making an attack, with which misses. Yeah, Dudley, absolutely. I don't know about a Balrog boxer. I know he mostly has the attacks that make him go forward, and you can use those to dodge through some projectiles, but I don't know if some of them are strike invincible. These attacks are generally coded for the purpose of being a dodge, but it's a committal dodge, because while they do draw away from the attack here, they automatically dive back in for it as well. Yeah, you can still see that behind my face. Uh, where's our pan tool, anyway? I think I have it right here. Nope, wrong button. Which key do I have that assigned to? 
one of these. Ah, I seem to be blanking out. I've already forgotten where my pan tool is. There we go. Move that a bit closer to the cr closer of the screen, center of the screen. So it's a very committal dodge here, in which after you've dodged their first attack, you are drawing back in, and we have a number of different attacks we can use here. Something we'll try to think about later, maybe. That's an idea. What if he could do his... The term for that is a weave or a sway. Okay. I know there had to be a... Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that a few times before. Thank you, Makeup. So yeah, we have a weave or sway. I'm not going to get DMCA'd by having Guilty Gear animations on here, am I? Uh, people have gotten away with worse. Thank you, Mako. You'll be able to teach me a lot more about FGC stuff, so given that I'm a few years behind. One idea we might speculate is if he can go ahead and do his smash attacks out of it. That may be an interesting way to make it a mix-up, so that's not necessarily too linear of an attack. So in terms of function, what we're wanting to do for the side special here, named Zandy Step after Dandy Step from Slayer here, this is called Dandy Step, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with Guilty Gear. And we'll just be stealing that. So it starts out with a dodge. We'll have invulnerability frames. And we'll be moving positions as we do that. Big fighters themselves share animations a lot. Note, well, I'm, I'm not talking about... a. Uh, Sharing animations between games, but the fact that I'm literally having Guilty Gear images showing here on screen, but not a part of gameplay. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. It's weird trying to figure out what you might get caught for. So we'll have a few invulnerability frames, and we'll be moving position while we're doing that. So go ahead and move... Or is position. If you make it your own, definitely. And I've got a little I've got a little idea. We'll definitely have to be pulling from Pile Bunker here because that is You know there's all the other options we have at a dandy step, but none of them are nearly as important. You know, we'll have We'll have the little kick here as a rising attack. And that functions as sort of a launcher. That's a small image. You got any better resolution one for me? So there's this one, which is his kick follow-up. And that will launch your opponent up in the air off of that. And that one is another one of his options. More importantly, we also have his pressure maneuver under pressure which is used as a pressure string. This is plus, he'll give you the slash. And then, if he baits you with a frame trap off of that, really, bi really big wrong one. Really, really big slam dunk off of that. And then that attack comes down, if it gets you on the counter hit, it's a floor bounce, and he gets a full combo off of that. We might not necessarily be stealing those other animations idea, ideas, but we are definitely, 100%, absolutely having to steal Pile Bunker. You don't get DMC aids for stuff like that unless some unreleased leak game or something, so don't worry about it. If it's not some big unreleased thing, they don't care about, uh, about it all. I'm not under any NDAs right now, so we're good to go. Move all this other stuff out of the way, since we'll be dealing with that later. Or possibly, might, an, might not even have room for that on stream at all. So we might not be copying this part of our animations. Go ahead and get back on our sketch layer. We might not be copying these, but we'll definitely be copying this. But I got an idea. We got a little zed. 
excuse me, Xander little spin to do on it. What we're concerned with figuring out is what we're doing for the start of that attack. It might just be a teleport. So, given how we're having to interpret the frame data here, we might have to make it a very, very big dodge. A lot of attacks might have a much smaller amount of commitment in Rivals of Aether compared to other fighting games, but I'll definitely have to look at the frame data. That will influence how we'll have to animate our dodge. We might not be able to get away with something like this if all the attacks are low, lower committal, and if someone misses an attack on you, then they're not really going to have to worry and they can get out of the way again. The objective is to punish them with a big pile bunker here. Or fake them out. What I have a, as an idea here is a movement option. So start with a side B input. We'll talk about it mechanically, because that supports how we're going to animate it. So it initially starts with a side B input, side special. You'll do a teleport in that direction. Sort of like how uh, Forsburn, his side special, has a horizontal ambiguity to it. The direction that you pick is the direction that you go in, but it also animates a smoke clone going in the other direction. So we're going to have a very horizontally ambiguous sort of symmetrical animation here. Because this functions as a mix-up mix or a punish tool, it needs to be a little bit harder to read. But on a successful read or somewhat reckless use, it should be much more punishable, given a very heavy amount of recovery on it. So you'll teleport in that direction, and as our own little spin on it, you can... Let's go ahead and say... When you reappear, you'll dash in the direction of your stick. What this means here is we can use it as a tool to teleport away, but also dash away with that. We don't necessarily have to return in the direction we started from. You'll see on Slayer over here, Go ahead and check mark that since we can get off of it. You'll see on Slayer here, he starts with a dodge going away and then immediately withdraws back in. But we don't have to restrict ourselves to that. If we're going for a sort of hit and run, punish, shmovement sort of character, and trust me, Xander needs his shmovement, we can go ahead and make it to where he can keep going after the dodge in another direction, maybe as an escape tool. Something very committal, though. Even as an impromptu air dash. That'd be interesting. I really like that idea. You can go ahead and use it as an air dash as well to ca catch up with your opponent. Auto save, stopping me from doing whatever I want. And then you have the choice to either no input. You'll have a dash that terminates earlier. And it'll just end without any sort of attack on it. But if you're holding special, pile bunker. And we can use that as sort of a move that has a lot of knockback growth. And that might even be a KO option or maybe even a combo starter. Given that it's going to have a... Hmm. No, let's go ahead and commit it as a punish tool or a potential KO option. So, high recovery. Which refers to the animation at the end of it. Those of you who have played Guilty Gear that know that dandy step here, or the pile bunker attack, this move has a lot of pause on the end of it. And if we had a much longer stream to be sitting here with, I'd actually show you on Accent Core itself. This animation is very, very dramatic and drawn out. After the punch occurs, he holds it for a while. 
What that means is that if you can, if you block it successfully, if Slayer makes the wrong read and he goes ahead and punches you while you're blocking, you have a very, very wide opportunity to punish him. In this case, we'll transfer that to given that you can't block in Rivals of Aether, we'll still keep a very, very high amount of recovery on it to where your opponent can easily dodge and maybe have enough time to go ahead and start a tilt or a jab maybe on, a har on the hardest of reads. So it's not going to be very functional as a combo starter. Because of that, we can invest a lot more in giving it a fast startup and high damage as a very, very high risk, high reward weapon. Funny enough, you could also potentially use it, say if you were comboing someone. Make the dodge be parry, by the way. You know, I was considering it just be, I could was considering making it just invincibility frames, but if we're using it specifically as a very usable punish tool, we could go ahead and have him start input wouldn't work that well at all. What do you mean? We will have a few frames of a window there for you to be able to change the direction that you're dashing. Sort of like a doesn't... What's her name? The Earth Weasel, one of the base characters. I've already forgotten her name. Didn't mean it... No, you didn't mean make it input it off of Perry. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, uh... I was originally thinking just make it be invincibility frames, but if we go ahead and give it parry frames on the start, that definitely sets it up much better as a counter tool. I like that idea. All right, let's go. Let's go ahead and write that one down. I like that. So teleport in that direction. Parry hitbox. And horizontally ambiguous. So the direction you're dodging in is not going to be very readable. This might be what we use for sort of our set play. Since we're having to do some sort of a quirky toolbox effect, there might be something for us to do with set play. I did mention the potential for particle annihilation, so what we'll express a lot better is when we'll start sketching it. I've got an idea here. Go ahead and get our signature sketch blue back. So for the start, we might have to move some of these other words out of the way, especially since we're, you know what, we're not even going to be dealing with these tilts right now. Tilts are, for the most part, very boring, and so far, I definitely don't have any ideas on what we're doing. Make it an iframe on, or two on startup. Parry frame seems like too much. It's definitely going to have a lot of balancing working to be doing, especially on a high risk, high reward. You definitely want to balance out said high risk and reward. You don't want to make it too rewarding or not rewarding enough. We're not dealing with tilts right now, so we'll get on the sketch layer. If we're wanting to make it immediate for the dodge, especially if it's supposed to be done on a... Since it's supposed to be so punishable, we definitely want it to have a much quicker startup. Another thing we could compare it to would be Anji's Spin in Guilty Gear Strive. That has 10 frames of startup, so you need an absolute hard read to get any mileage off of that one. But you have a lot of options out of that, and even if you parry successfully, you're not guaranteed a punish, but at the same time, you're invincible until you can block again. So it's still a high, a hard read that you'll need to be doing, but it's a sort of lower risk, low reward. Only issue that you have 10 frames of startup. Parry frame seems like a bit too much, definitely. That's what I was thinking. Go ahead and start with... You'll have little, I'll represent him with a stick figure because we're not going to be actually animating him for the startup here. Go ahead, have stick figure Xander here. But when you press the input, go ahead and do a little teleport. I wonder what sort of little spark we could do there. 
I sort of like the ideas that we have set up on these, so we might do something similar. Have a little... Oh, that's an idea for you. What about another one of those little asymptotic stars? Go ahead and do that for a little spark when we dodge. And have that be a horizontally ambiguous animation. You know what's funny about that? That's an X for Xander. So we might go ahead and play up that symbol a lot more as we're doing our animations. Start with a teleport jab, and then you go in one of these directions to the side. Where it starts, you have no idea. Then what we'll have is the option to go into. We'll go ahead and make the lines red for while we're talking about this one. You have the option to either go into just a dash or an attack off of that one. Now for the dash itself, we have a bit more of an animation freedom here. There's my scroll bar. We can make him do something similar to this on the way back in, but we're not locked into that idea necessarily. We might do something different there, but what I know is that we'll definitely need to be doing a pile bunker on the attack animation. So we'll go ahead and try to sketch that. Let's pull that reference over here. Come over here, Slayer. I need to use you. So we'll sketch around what his figure appears to be. Even though most of that is obscured by the punch animation there, let's go ahead and head back to Dustloop Wiki and see if we can get the sprite for that from Accent Core. Maybe that one's not obscured by the effects. Accent Core. Let's see. When I look off to the side, it definitely. That's another thing I need to fix on my model. Whenever I look off to the side, it makes me close my eyes. A little obnoxious. Mostly makes me look like I'm lost in thought while I'm talking, although I'm definitely just looking on my other screen here. Where's our pile bunker? Nah, that's even worse. Bring that over here. That's even worse. That's got more of it obscured. Harder to see where his actual shoulder is. Although I love the extra range on that one. The fact that he... Punches a good two or three feet in front of where his actual fist is. By the way, whenever Slayer is actually coming to Guilty Gear Strive, I might drop Gold Lewis for him. Head there, we have roughly his shoulders there. Arm is bent like that. There's the hand. This hand is coming forward directly into his punch. Spine bends further down here. Oh, wait, that's going on that layer there. That's an interesting... Hold on. We'll go ahead and make a new layer here. Just so we can have something better to reference. Go ahead and start that again. Got his... That's showing under everything else. Bring that to the top. Go matcha, Welcome. We're currently working on stealing animations. Shoulders there, that's roughly where his left arm is. Other arm comes forward into the punch. Spine remains mostly straight, but he is leaning back. The important part to notice is how his front leg is bent here. That's going to be the messy part to draw. We'll go ahead and bring this over here, and we'll just sort of use that as a skeleton to steal since we're trying to really, really get that animation down. Put that back on our sketch layer. The Slayer sketch layer. So drawing underneath here, we'll go ahead and do the somewhat oval head here. Get the eye, 
go ahead and draw in our little eyeball there. I think a lot of Xander's actual figure is defined by the lab coat, so that's another thing that we have to deal with the animation here. You'll also see that Slayer's lab coat, or his uh, regular coat, blows back here, similarly from the animation. So we'll have to do that with the lab coat as well. Pants are important, so let's focus on drawing the legs here. Go ahead and get that front pant leg down there. Bend at the knees. And what we're doing differently with the feet this time, you'll notice how he's standing on his toe. So we'll be doing that similarly enough with the feet here. Go ahead and have that extend downward. Get our little feet seas going. A little rough sketch. You'll see that his... You'll see that his heel comes up off the ground a little bit. We're doing something roughly similar with the other leg that's mostly going to be on the entire sole of the foot, though. Pant leg comes down here. Foot comes down. Get that curved a little bit. Toe starts. Other toe. And other toe. We can go ahead and start erasing some of this stuff now. You know, I think the biggest thing holding me back from drawing on the regular is just an understanding of anatomy. Once I get over that hill, I might just be doing this for leisure a lot more often because this is very relaxing for me as well. I know Go Macha is another artist, so let me know how you think. What was your first big art hurdle in trying to figure out exactly what made you want to do it on the regular, as sort of a hobbyist thing? What was the biggest first thing that you had as a hurdle, and then a after that, everything sort of came together? So we'll go ahead and do that for the lab coats. We're not too focused on the other details there. We'll also have an op opportunity to show off the shirt here, so that's going to come up here. Go ahead and get... We have an idea of what we're doing with the rest of the figure here, so we can go ahead and erase the spine that we had set up. We already know what we're doing with the fists, and the back arm is how we have the opportunity to do something Xander specific instead. Actually, you know what? While we're at it, delete that entire layer. So, as well, collar from the lab coat comes up out here, comes around to the back, get the neck started, shirt collar. That's going to be behind the lab coat arm, so we don't have to focus too much on it there. Shoulder starts. How is that drawn over on Slayer here? It's mostly bending forward into the attack, so we'll have to interpret that here, like this. Whenever you are finally proud or satisfied of a drawing, like, wow, this actually looks like something is the best way you can explain it. When I was making my reference sheets for Xander, I was actually a lot more satisfied with the end product than I thought I would be, despite my lack of artistic skills. So it's definitely, once you can get over the hurdle of hating it while you're drawing, it feels very, very rewarding to finally have something finish. Now, how can we draw this? It's still staying mostly around his waist, so we're going to be doing that here. Lab coat will bend off. Most of it's going to remain straight over here. Get that, and then have it sort of bend together in the back. But it's mostly blowing out from the recoil of the attack. Get that started. What's his tie doing? I know he has a tie. His tie stays straight down for his animation, so we're going to be doing the same thing here. Just because for a few of these more expressive animations, we might need to know 
What the die doing? Otto saved the bane of my existence. Actually, the boon of my existence. As a programmer, I definitely need to have stuff get auto-saved a lot. After that, you were hooked and kept doing it because you still surprise yourself. I've seen your art, and it's definitely very wonderful. So, here's an alternate idea for you. Uh, go ahead and get that actual punch in there. So, draw our little lizard fist. And we're still not being able to draw our little lines the way we want to. Draw another knuckle. Have that bend back up in the back there. Lizard thumb. Arm comes out. And we don't need to draw the other part of that there. So that punch is coming out. Thumb is on the right side, correct? Draw a little impact here. Might even have some extra little sparks coming off it, who knows. But we're doing a very big blow here, super stupid. Now here's the idea for you. We haven't yet decided if we're doing the glasses. But if we are, go ahead and draw two big dorky circles here. And obscure the backgrounds of them. If we are going ahead with the giant dorky nerd glasses, Go ahead and draw the start of the other arm there. That's where the lab coat starts. Get the shoulder and the back. Get the bridge there. Finger goes up. And how would that look? Get the other finger going down here, which I'm still having troubles with that darn drawing. A stupid tablet needs some fixing. Get a little start of that. Finish off that. Thumb shows up over here. Go ahead and obscure the background there. And how do you like that for a little joke? Have him push his glasses back up as he's doing his as he's doing his pile bunker. That's an idea I thought of the other day. So that's one potential interpretation of what he's doing with his other arm, and that's definitely what we can do with while we are stealing the rest of the animation there, we can do a funny little gimmick with the arm that isn't being used as part of the attack. And that's how we're doing a lot of the extra expression that we're doing here. So we'll leave that on the plate. Go ahead and clear that off. A funny little bit of characterization. So that's how our boy slides back into your DMs after he's dodged your initial attack. Well, we have a yes vote from Gomacha, so... I'll definitely see if I can portray that with the sprites. It might be a lot easier to just draw glasses for a lot of these on the sprites themselves. So, we might go ahead and give Xander Salamander some glasses on his Rivals of Aether model. It'll also be a lot easier just to draw little white circles for his eyes on all of his attacks. I forget. We looked at sprites the other day. Rivals of Aether sprite sheet. Who were we looking at? Oh, that's right, Rastor. Rivals of Aether, Rastor sprite. Get that copied. Oh, yes. 
I want just a regular sprite of him. Ah, that'll do. Go ahead and while we're stealing this. So something we can definitely reference for the sprites is you'll see here on Rastor. He's wearing goggles all the time. So he has the little pixel circles representing his eyes at all times. We might end up being able to do that as a very easy way. Oh, whoops. We might be able to do that as a very easy way to just animate the face on Xander here. Now, since we are being more free with whatever we're doing for the animations here, this is so freaking awesome. Well, I'm glad you're reading. I'm glad you're watching here, Kayla. This is one of the fun parts of game design, and it's why I've been interested in it for the longest time. I've mentioned it on stream before. This is generally what I'm trying to do for a career, is the design aspect of making fighting games. I don't think a couple of you were here for the stream last night, but Blaze Warrior, I think, was someone who asked in the chat why we are, or why I'm so concerned on fighting games are what made me love them so much. And this, what we're doing all here, is exactly why. Because I think it is the medium that allows for the most character expression through, say, animations and the actual character design. This is essentially the design part where you are forced to... You know the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. When it comes to fighting games, you have to make your cover describe exactly what is going on in the book. So that's what's so fun about, about this. Having restrictions can actually give you a bit more creativity, because you have a few rules to, to stick with. You have to do a lot more thinking to get your point across. Now, we know about the teleport that we're starting with, and we're definitely coming out with the funny little pile bunker there. What we're now going to decide for our most important and signature attack is how we come out with a dash. Slayer here sort of leans it into it on the ground. But what we have different about Rivals of Aether is that we can do it in the air or on the ground. So we don't have a restriction to do this if we're on the ground. If we're copying that for a ground animation, sure. But what I'd like to do is come up with something different. And I've got a little idea. Hold on. I think I have the rest of my audio muted. Let's head to... Let's see what I can reference. Subspace Emissary, Captain Falcon, Intro. Uh, go ahead, watch that on YouTube, see if we can get that in here. Mute that. Ah, uh, there we go. You know what? I don't think we'll get DMCA'd, so... Why not go ahead and show off the entire thing here? Bring that over here. I'll go ahead and unmute it for a little bit. Although I don't think that's... Oh, wait, I have my audio devices arranged differently. Let me change that to this over here. Quiet that down a little bit. I think that should do well for the audio. So this is a cutscene from the South Space Emissary, which was the single-player mode in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Wow, 2008, this is really old. Wait for it. There's our boy. Right there. How's that for re-entry? 
Maybe we can try to steal that pose. Go ahead and snip that off over here. What do you think? So that's definitely one pose. What we're wanting to do, since we have a lot of dramatic flair on all the other attacks, sort of being flashy, because I definitely love to be playing these games for the sake of being flashy. We definitely want to have something exaggerated and cartoonish for a re-entry on dodge. You know, we might have to sketch that out and then just do a whole bunch of other little ideas to figure out what we're doing for our re-entry dash. Let's see if we can go ahead and doodle something for there. That's a high pre-entry, definitely. That's for if we're fainting it, or if we're using it as a dodge chase, potentially. So the legs might do something different in mid-air, but that's well split it up into the air and ground versions here. Move this up here. And move this down here. Aerial, ground. Get back to our sketch blue. I think we'll just draw the same upper body since we'll use that for both of them. Go ahead and start with the head because that's where you scale everything else off of. And since we're going to be focusing on the glasses now, since it definitely helps a lot with the potential characterization here, Go ahead and draw those for the eyes from here on out. Draw that, draw that, and since we're not doing the un underlying eyes, we'll go ahead and edit that out. Let's see. Bring Mr. Falcon further over here. And let's see. Just dramatically bring out the arms over here. Get started on the lab coat. Collar. Whoops. Don't move everything. Collar. Other part of the lab coat comes over here. Draw the other side, get those sleeves up and out there. We'll have to draw fingers splayed out like that, and then the thumb coming this way. This will be a lot easier for us to draw once we actually get that darn issue with the tablet fixed. I guess it is tablet side. I might have to check my drivers and get them an update. Go ahead and draw the thumb over here. Get those fingers going up over there. We're not going to be too concerned about the anatomical proportions here. Now, similar to how we've been doing with the jab and with the pile bunker here, we're definitely going to need to flare out that coat a lot. His body is mostly standing up straight, despite the dramatic part of that pose here. Oh, I am drawing on layer 8. Interesting. Flare this out. And get this going over here. And then draw in the bottom of it. Get the middle. Go ahead and draw in the shirt collar. Ah, what a mess. Shoulders. We're not going to be animating the tie too much here, so... That's not going to be flaring around too much. After all, the scarf that Captain Falcon has isn't doing too much movement. So we don't need to be drawing that on here. Now we'll take this. Copy and paste that. 
Uh, whoops, why did I move those things? All right, we'll have to see exactly where we drew on our separate layers again. Of course. Sketch that, move that over to layer two. We'll have to figure out doing the head again. Which layer is that? That should be on six, right? No, it isn't. It's on eight, isn't it? So here's the first huge artist dilemma for us. Okay, it was on sketch layer. Draw that, copy that over here. Move that down here, whoops. Sketch layer. Select that head, make sure we have only that head selected, and then move that down over here since we had them drawn onto separate layers like morons. Might have to merge that down and make a bit more space. That's not it. Now we have to search through all these layers. There's that one. Move that up. It was on the correct sketch layer, right? There we go. We'll move Xander up there. Now, once we figure out this part of it, I think we'll go ahead and move Pile Bunker down here. Definitely need to do, to do that with our glasses layer, which I think was up here. There we go. Draw him in right there's probably where he fits. There, now we have a little bit more room. Something that I've definitely seen in my history of Smash modding is a lot of character animations have the same upper body, and every special attack in Smash Brothers has a different animation for the ground and the air version. So the upper body here is going to remain the same on both of our examples. But the lower body is where we change it. In this case, we'll go ahead and copy Captain Falcon's pose here. And dramatically bringing down his foot. He is once again on his toes. Autosave. Interrupting me again. Go ahead and draw the little toesies down there. Get this one. And in the middle. Uh-oh. We have a scumbag in our Twitch chat. Hey there, buddy. I've got... a ban for you. Get bonked. Problem solved. Unfortunately, that's still going to show up on Restream for a bit. Say some cute things, and we can definitely wipe that scum off the face of the earth. The other leg goes out completely straight. Interesting, because I don't imagine this one being a very good way for you to stop yourself. That's mostly a dramatic pose, but if you're putting all your weight here... Huh, no, maybe that does put enough weight on the back foot. That's a very good way to stop yourself. Go ahead and do the same drawing here, roughly. Get the other toe down here. And middle toe. So that's going to be our grounded landing. Once again, we now have to search for the other parts of this. We'll merge it all onto one layer once we get Captain Falcon himself out of the picture. So there's our re-entry on the ground. Maybe have a couple of little fire sparks going across the ground after it. In the air, we get to do something a little bit different. Might end up being the same thing, 
Or maybe we change the direction of the legs. Maybe have the front one be bent and the back one be straight out since it's implied he has a lot more aerial momentum that he's carrying. In that case... Hmm. Nope, I think I'll make both of them bent. Go ahead and draw this one straight out here. And toes are not going to be bent because he is in the air for this animation. And then for this for the other leg, ah, uh, we'll keep them both bowed. I think that's what he was doing for his pose while he was flying through the air there. The little toesy woesies. Da 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 da. Lizard feet. Even though that's a gecko. Now I think we can finally get rid of. Where's Captain Falcon? There we go. We can get rid of that layer. Oh, great. We can just delete this part of the layer. And I think from here on out, we can just go ahead and merge things down, right? No way that'll end badly. Besides, we're doing a very expendable sketch here instead. Now I think we're able to select our whole character here and move them around. There we go. We can do that there. And we also have this sander all in the same layer. So there's our re-entry if we're not doing an attack. He'll strike a pose for a little bit, but it's not going to go nearly as long as the pile bunker animation. You know, just drawing the glasses up there is a lot easier. You don't see anything. That was, uh, well, I um, already got him out. I hit the ban button, so we don't need to worry about him anymore. You can see it in the uh, restream chat on the side over here. Oh, what do you know? You got that position right there where I need it. Pile bunker the, the spammer there. Look at that. Just another bot trying to advertise follow botting and all that stuff. I'm not here for that. Quick. Time to be a perfectionist. So there's our most important signature move. What we can debate after this later is if it's also cancelable into aerial attacks during the recovery of this. It might be a bit overpowered in that case, so we might have to leave it with this. The interesting part is that we get a lot of playtime once we actually have the character started to be built. So we'll figure that out later. Ah. So the most important part, our pile bunker, is now codified. Where's our Slayer? I think I can move you back over here now. So we have an option to, after the teleport, use this as a getaway or possibly a chaser. Say if we have a very high damage attack, we can use that as a way to chase after them. And maybe if we can get our knockback right on just a certain amount of attacks, or even if we have some cancels, impl cancels implemented, what would be really, really fun is using Pile Bunker as a combo finisher. Say if you get them on a very ho far horizontal knockdown, you can teleport after them, give yourself a little bit of a slide, and then Pile Bunker for the finisher. We have our side special, and I think this is the attack that we already know what to do with. We have no idea what to be doing for our... Neutral special and down special. Oh, right. That's another thing. What we can play with a bit here is maybe the teleport itself. If we're going to be going with our whole 
toy box theme behind the whole of Rivals of Aether character design, we can go ahead and give ourselves a little atom particle placed there. And you might be able to use that for set play. Say, if we use something for a punish tool, that might leave something to be set up there, and then we can interact with this teleport point later. Maybe use that with one of the other specials, potentially to swap around to points that we've teleported from before, or use those as projectiles. We did speculate the idea of having some sort of particle annihilation, so maybe we could create these as setups between our different attacks, and then once we make multiple of our multiple instances of our particles collide, that might be a way we get an explosive finisher, maybe as a way to stop someone's recovery. Go ahead and teleport at the ledge. Go ahead and have the ledge here. Someone's trying to recover their way up. Get a teleport away, and then set up a projectile once you have your little particle here. Send in another one to interact, and then you have big explosion which interrupts their attempt to recover. Maybe. Might need a lot of time to set up, but we're looking for playtime opportunities here. Ways to make this move set very creative, very interactive, and most of all, fun. Now, what to do for our other animations? Jab's a cute little finger gun. We have a very dramatic pile bunker. I did mention the possibility of Rocket Boots as an up special, but I don't think we're going to be doing too creative of a moveset there. It might just be Xander himself blasting off with fire on the, on the tips of his feet, and then going into the air and stomping on someone. Not too much characterization opportunity there. James, you mentioned a laser. Where do we fit that in? Because we definitely, if we're going for the glasses here, we need eye beams. We need eye lasers. I don't know if that's reserved for a neutral special or if that's, say, you know what? We're just here to play. We're not making any final decisions here. We're starting with the most obvious ones, but we're here to toy around with our potential animations ideas. You know what? I think we can just go ahead and copy the other one here from our standing animation. Copy this boy, drag him down over here. Merge with layer below. Go ahead and redraw our glasses in here with a different shade of blue than what we started with. Now if we're playing off of the Psychonauts powers as well as the thumbnail you've seen me use the, use the most for our Guilty Gear Knights, mostly because it is my absolute favorite, as well as potentially another Gold Lewis reference. Do the same thing, bring our arm back up here. Elbow, get that arm going up in that direction. Lab coat gets finished. Hmm. Reorient, at, re reorient that arm a little bit, because we want to have the actual ray itself being shown. Go ahead and draw that incredibly large arm. Go ahead and erase the extra part here. Very, very long arm. You know what? That's just going to be incredibly bothersome to me, so I'm going to... Ah, uh, that'll do. I can get past my perfectionism, but I want it to look a little bit tolerable. Now, let's see. I'm trying to imagine in my head how that's going to be drawn. You know what? Let's look up another reference real quick. 
We're heading back to the Deathloop Wiki. I think you all know exactly what I'm looking for here. Paste that. Drag that bad boy down here. There we go. There's our boy Gold Lewis. So we see how his hand is positioned here. He has his fingers over here and then the thumb below. Finger going to the side of his glasses over there. So that's what we're going to emulate. Finger up. Oh, wow. We have no resolution to work with it down here. Scale this bad boy up. I need him to be larger. Gives us much more room to play with. Get that cancelled. And we'll have to redo the arm again because we have to reposition his hand to make this a lot more readable. Animation readability is very, very important, especially in a fighting game. And it's actually another tool you can exploit. Finger there. Get this one down and curled away to the side. Thumb down here. It's a little hard to tell there, but I'll do better on the sprite itself. And then we'll have to move the arm further upward for this. And... So we have to fi figure out how to draw this part. I think the arm can go over here and we'll get... That at least will tell us what we're trying to do here, even if the arm itself isn't perfect. And go ahead and separate that onto a different layer. We could even angle his head further down for this, but what we could do for a downstrong idea... Make him do a little blaster at his feet. So that's a good way we could also potentially ledge camp someone. That is a very good way to... You know what, I think that might even be cohesive in the character design itself, because especially if you're ledge camping, we could go ahead and give this an extra hitbox down here. So if you hit someone right as they're coming up on the ledge, could be a way to keep them dunked and going downward. Mako, I might be asking for your advice in the future to try to balance this stuff correctly, because we don't want Xander to be blatant blatantly overpowered, especially if he has too easy of a recovery prevention button. And there we go, that's one idea for down strong at least. Alright. Merge with the layer below. And just so we're not, we're not interrupting the rest of that, we'll just go ahead and we already get the idea. We'll draw a little red beam down here. And have that bad boy be exploding. That is, if we don't use that for, say, a neutral special. I very much like the idea, but... We'll have to get very, very creative with our... With our use of the neutral and down specials, and a laser isn't necessarily too creative, unless, say, we steal from Rob, we might have to be able to use it as a sort of ricochet and way to bounce off projectiles. If we're going to be very creative with our projectile use, we might have something where this is actually a neutral special instead. And we could have an aimable laser or projectile and that maybe he could fire a laser there that could interrupt, interact with a set play particles for the explosion. So we'll leave that open. We're not too solid on the downstrong idea here. What do we have left? What else is super obvious? 
you know, I think we can try to figure out which layer this is on. Nope, not that one. Where is it that we put our little Falco boy here? Rastor. Show me where you are. And we'll figure it out later. He's not hurting anyone up there. Jab, side special entertainment. So now we just get to sit back and take another little bit of a break to figure out exactly what our next attack we're going to try to figure out is. Now me, I like to do a lot of air combos, and so we might have a sort of combo monster character that, after we get a punish, will have a lot of aerial ways to follow them and intercept them and interact with them otherwise. We might be able to do a lot of figuring out what the animations are for what we're supposed to do with the combo game afterwards. Now, maybe forward smash can be an explosion. I like the idea. Definitely something sort of similar to what we're doing for the jab animations here. But what would it be? Oh, that's an idea. All right, you got me thinking. Let's see how we can carry this one onward. So, if we're going to overplay the whole nerdy bit, that might be a fun thing to laugh about with the whole messing around with the glasses. Especially considering that's one of the emotes I had for the VTuber model itself. Go ahead and we will draw the head this time. Facing away. Draw our big glasses up here. Erase the lines in between. Get rid of all those other little details so we don't get other ideas. And we might try to do this a similar animation over here, where he's sort of... adjusting the bridge of his glasses. That should be an arch. Finger up there. Let's see if he's facing in that direction. Then his thumb is going to be on the other side. Get that there. Finger goes up here. Thumb goes out in this direction. And have his little hand come back up here. Erase the parts that are in between. What kind of an abomination is that? Okay, hold on. Just so we can get a bit of a better image here. Okay, draw that part of the hand, and then this part just barely curls up in there. There we go. Just as a rough guess of where that's supposed to go. Get the sleeve up there. Focus on the rest of the body. Mostly because the lab coat itself functions as a very good way to sketch the rest of the body's shape. I'm going to go ahead and keep doing that as the main part of how we figure out the scaling for the rest of the character. Display that out over here a little bit more again. Around right there should be the belt point. Collar, and then the shoulder starts from over there. Draw that, get the elbow down in here. Get that a little bit pointed. Lab coat comes down into this direction. And we're not going to see the shoulder too much behind that. But the point is, he's pushing the glasses up, facing away. And then maybe have just a arm straight out. Erase that. Actually, no, erase that too. 
So how about this? Come on, you're making it hard to set up the joke here. Talk to the hand, sister. Kaboom. Just have our little spiky explosion over there. Now we definitely want to make it more sciency in its appearance, so not just going to be one of those spiky setups there. Is that a that's supposed to be the collar? He needs more shoulder. That's what's wrong here. More of the shoulder setup. Collar starts there. Ah, this will be so much easier once I fix this darn tablet. Get the lab coat over there. Neck. Shirt collar. Ah, why are you such a mess? Shirt collar. And we do have an opportunity to play with the tie here since it's implied there's... Another back force coming from an explosion in this direction. Go ahead and draw our tie flipping up once again. Had that as sort of the back blow. And then we don't need to do too much with the legs here. While we're going for sort of a smug, flashy character, I definitely like the talk-to-the-hand approach here. Go ahead and... Heck, that thing's starting to tick me off at this point. I might just even go sloppier on the lines. You'll see they are definitely getting sloppier overall. Yeah, it looks a little un uncomfortable. We'll just do that, even though he's not even standing flat on the ground anymore with that one. We're not too concerned, especially since this one isn't set in stone, but... Go back to our animation lines layer. Mostly he just rotates around in place. And then this comes out of the pocket. And then we'll have a big explosion here. Push these bad boys up onto the face. Now we do have an opportunity to look at what sort of explosion we could do there for that attack. I wonder if there's any sort of sciency symbols we could use here. I don't want to necessarily overplay those crosses or the atom symbols too much. Hmm. That's another one to think about. Special effects. So we'll do that later. That could be a good idea for a forward strong right there, but for now we'll just draw on our animation layer. Give him a little, uh, hmm. Yeah, I think we can just go with another little cross here for the moment. We definitely don't want to overplay that one, though. You can see I'm caring less and less about the drawing as the stream goes on. Hmm. I'll think about that a lot tonight and try to figure out what other sort of little explosion we can do there. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm ignoring the most important part of all. Look at my buttons. We have plenty of symbols to borrow from there. So why don't we do a little one of these ditties? Just 
just as a rough idea. Maybe have it spin a little bit. If we're going for the full science theme. Especially given the extra implication he might be looking away because it could be hazardous. Another thing we could do is maybe for one of the other explosions draw an ohm, which is used for electrical resistance and could be used for a more electrical focused attack. Doesn't look like there's any other very important pins I could be using. Off of the jacket, at least. So that's an excellent idea on there. Now, how's the schedule looking? Hold on. I might have a couple of obligations to attend to, so I'm going to look at that real quick. Go ahead and take a break real quick. Have a moment to brainstorm. And take another drink. All right. Now there's another idea, now that, I, now that I've remembered it. Since we are doing our strong attacks here, which are definitely one of the most important parts of defining a Smash Brothers character, smash attacks are definitely a lot more important to your characterization than tilts, for example. But there are some very interesting tilts out there for us to draw from. Now here is a very dramatic example for us to pull from again. We'll go ahead and we're doing this one entirely differently. Head facing upward. Have it sort of a rounded tip right there. Have the glasses barely showing off on the edge here, but we might not even have room for them to show. Is it getting worse? Look at that. Look at the length of that. That's ridiculous. I might just have to keep drawing in an absolutely massive resolution. Go ahead and draw that, and go ahead and move this. Nope, I think that gets to stay there. Instead, we're going to make more room by moving our upstrong symbol out of the way over here. And then from there, probably, I think we can move him a little bit further upward. Oh, wrong layer, again. Sketched layer, move this, I said... Oh, wow, we don't even know what layer that's on. Keep it on the sketch layer, then. Strong, get out of here. We already know what we're doing. So here's an idea. Get, let's see, we're gonna, we might want to start with the spine here. And we're going to be arching back again, but instead, this time... We are looking upward, because this is an upward smash attack, as opposed to, say, the jab here, where we have the spine going roughly in the same shape, but facing forward. Or as opposed to Pile Bunker doing a very similar maneuver. Instead, we'll be doing... Go ahead with the crouching legs again. Uh, make those pants a little bit thinner. Get that leg started in that direction. Feet. Very important part of the animation because they're where you plant most of your weight. Get another one. And the autosave. You two are teaming up on me, making it even more difficult for me to draw. I'll just have to pay more attention to this at another time. Mm hmm. Now that I think about it, maybe it depends on screen size. Draw a little spiral and you can see how huge that line is there. So maybe if I zoom in, we're not going to have to deal too much with 
that little issue in drawing our curved lines. Doodle this here, get our little toe, other toe, further over here. There we go. At least that one looks more like he's standing on the ground than this little mishap. But that was the roughest of roughest sketches that we're worrying about tonight. Go ahead, draw the waist. And now... Lab coat arches a lot more towards the top because of what we're doing here. It's also probably actually going to hang completely off the torso for this animation. Maybe come down barely to the thighs here. Get that in the back. Have it on this side. Do roughly the same thing. Get the torso started. Have that curve back up. I think we can remove the spine now, given that we know where the body figure mostly goes. That's another interesting thing, is the tie usually serves as a very good middle point for where the rest of the body should be going. Very helpful direction for when you're drawing this character. Now what we're going to have to do differently is how we draw the head here. How am I going to do that? Shirt collar started, just since we are going to need that. Get a neck. And then give ourselves a little sort of wedge shape. Might have to zoom in just to make this one a lot more comfortable. Somewhat like that. Let's make this a little bit wider out like that. Actually, that serves as a very good divide between where his mouth should be and the rest of his head. Gla glasses. Hmm. How do we make that one look? Ah, uh, something like that. We might not have too much room to budge them around, especially since they'll be out of the view there. Lab coat starts that way, get that one going off over there. And now, the coup de gras. Collar. And the important part of the animation is what we're doing with the arms. Shoulder should start roughly right here. Go ahead and have his forearms raised up. Lab coat continues the rest of the way. And I'll have to bring those back closer a little bit. Hold on. Bring this one over here, definitely. Bring this one a little bit closer. Erase this over here. And one reason I didn't want to overplay usage of the same symbols earlier is because we have very specific ways we can use them here. And you're not going to see it necessarily from his... Those are going to have to bend more. Erase those. Oh wait, no, I have a control C button. The best friend of the artist. I'm going to need to draw them roughly in that direction. We'll get the anatomical links down better later. And now, how, is that, how exactly is that going to be drawn? All right, I got an idea. And it involves first fixing this darn thing. Get 
got our hands. Get that one started, get that one started. Get that thinner, since that's supposed to be one of two fingers. And in this case, thumbs are going to be closer to his face. So have those like that. Have the same thing over here. Do roughly the same thing with the other hand. And it's hard to tell right there. Mostly because I can't draw off of that pose. Hold on. I can't find the one I'm looking for. But, while we're here, have our special effects be one of those giant crosses but laid over his arms like that. And then have the other parts of them extending off in this direction. And then mostly you get the idea where he's supposed to be moving. He's leaning back into the attack and he's crossing this X up over his head, which you'll see it's not positioned directly over the center of his feet. So once we get to the actual spreading part, we'll have to move the rest of this over basically. But you get the general idea of what the pose that he should be striking there. Arms crossed, and once I get the anatomy better on that, they might actually be crossing somewhat in the center of his arms there. And then just have that as a giant X-shaped explosion for the up, up smash. Destined to hit above and not necessarily in front of your opponent. A lot of the attacks here are supposed to have very specific zones where they hit. So you want to have high damage hitboxes in very specific areas and not necessarily a very wide way to combo off, off of certain hits. A lot of more offensively ori oriented rushdown characters will have all of their attacks hitting just roughly in this area as well. Another thing you find on a lot of Rivals of Aether characters is that their neutral air just basically turns them into a giant hitbox. Circular, multiple hits, and you just turn that on during your approach to make it harder to defend against. And if any of those hits hit, then you start a combo off of that. We are not doing that here. We want to have very specific, very specialized high damaged attacks. We might be able to have wide hitboxes for our tilts, for example. Go ahead and make it to where he's able to start a combo with those. But we want to have very dramatic pinpoint finishers with all the smash attacks here. Hmm. What else are we doing? I think that might actually be... An interesting point to think about how far we've gotten here. We might be at a stopping point. It's been a good three hour stream and I'd like to go on longer, but what other ideas do we have? It might be a good, a good chance to take a break and do a little bit more brainstorming in the meantime. What do you think? All that happens, I'll think about our other aerial, aerial attacks. That is a lot of progress today. <sighs> you know, I think I'll definitely have to analyze a lot of other characters that we're taking inspiration from and see how we can replicate their sorts of aerial attacks. We're wanting to be able to get a good combo off of a punish and have a few good moves for peppering an opponent into doing something we don't want them to do. Otherwise, we could use the rest of our time here just for brainstorming. We have to figure out exactly what we're doing for our neutral special, down special, and to a lesser extent, up special. I think up special and side special are already figured out. So the rest of our toy box comes from figuring out what to do with neutral and down B. From our ideas earlier, we were thinking about having 
let's go ahead and start typing ideas down while we're here. It's going to go on its own new layer. Actually, let's go ahead and get an entirely new sheet. All right, so neutral special and down special still need some idea need some ideas placed on them. Neutral special, I'm definitely thinking about some case of a projectile because that's just a very important part of Rivals of Aether character design. You need to have a projectile on there somewhere. Most characters have one to interact with, or at least something as part of your set play toy box mechanic. I can't immediately think of anyone that doesn't ha uh Clarion doesn't have one, but just about everyone else has something they're doing for set play. We already have side special used for a dandy step. So neutral special and down special are what we'll be saving for our projectile potentially attacks. Although dandy step potentially has set play in the fact that it might drop an atom there. If you're tired, stop. Dang, progress big time. Think I'm really inspired. Do what I need to do. Definitely, but I did mention previously that I'm loving the streaming stuff. I don't know what else I'd be doing tonight if I, if I wasn't doing this. Maybe I will just play, play Rivals off stream and take some inspiration there. It's a little late. I'm not going to change it into a Rivals friendly stream right here and now. Projectile. Maybe it'll be bouncing off of walls or surfaces. Something reflectable. We can use that as a good way to chase after our opponent and aim at them. Interacts with other set play, maybe. Now, we did have an idea for maybe a Thunder Jacket set up on the down special, but I'm thinking we can change that one, definitely. I'll have to look at other boxer characters and see what their stuff is. Ah, we used enough brain power for, t f brain power for tonight. I think that's a good stopping point for all of us. Three hours. Wow. Could you imagine having college courses that long? Not like those absolutely totally exist. But thank you all for being here today tonight. We've gotten a lot of progress done. And we have some very excellent characterization and a direction on what we're doing for our Rivals of Aether project. Tomorrow and for the rest of, t uh, rest of tonight, I might just be sitting down and trying to do some more brainstorming or some more work. Try to see about some little Xander clip compilations I could put out on social media. So it's a working weekend for the rest of us here. Definitely looking forward to next week. Just because I'm trying to build my schedule given that it's Saturday night and almost Sunday today. I think we'll focus more on Noida specifically because that's definitely a game I'm wanting to get deeper into. We might try to cut back the streaming or at least move more of it over to the weekends so that I have a bit more time to try to work on something during the week. So expect more Noida. We're definitely going to focus on trying to build Rivals, Rivals of Aether stuff, but we might skip an art stream next week, just because I want to try to get some spreading stuff done in the meantime. And as usual, expect Guilty Gear. The week after that is the very important one where things start with... The new Melty Blood and the week following is going to be the Nicktoon Smash. Next weekend, I might go ahead and do Drunk Halo. Who knows? But that's what the schedule is looking out to be. Let me know on social media or anywhere else if you have any other ideas. But for now, class is wholeheartedly dismissed. Thank you all for being so